What is it you fear? And how is that fear keeping you from entering the land of promise? This week we're reviewing portion Shelach, which means he sent in Numbers chapters 13 through 15. And this portion includes uh, the most egregious uh, testing of God uh, of the Israelites, the, the consequences of which we're still dealing with today. And so this is a very, it's a very weighty portion, uh, mm. but we're going to dive in. Yes. Uh, before we do that, though, we want to make sure you know that this was, that, that what had happened with the, the, the spies, the men who spied out, uh, this wasn't Moses' or God's idea, was That's it? That's right. It was no. not. No, the people are the ones who, uh, who wanted to do this, and we, we do, but we don't find that in this portion. And there's mm -hmm. an important lesson there, and it is this. You can study a passage of Scripture and think you know exactly what happened, but then later on in the Bible, it gives you information that you wish you had when you read that the first time. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to have the whole counsel of God. But in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it says Moses is reviewing uh, the events of his history with leading the people. And he says, Then all of you approached me and said, Let us send men before us that they may search out the land for us and bring back to us word of the way by which we should go up and the cities which we shall enter. The thing pleased me, and I took 12 of your men, one man for each tribe. So now we find out it wasn't God's idea. It wasn't Moses' idea. It was the people's idea. Mm -hmm. Then you ask, was it a good idea? And I think if it was a good idea, God would have given them the idea. Mm -hmm. But sometimes God gives us permission to do what we want to do. And um, that can be a dangerous thing. Well, it's much like how it is being a parent. Yeah. We do for our children, and then they have ideas mm -hmm. that aren't ours, but we're, we go along with it yeah. because it could be a good idea. Yes. And then we let them try yeah. and fail. Um, so so there's, there's, there's an aspect of Israel's continued growth toward maturity. That's right. That is, that is, that is I think, important in how Moses and Adonai mm -hmm. allowed this to play out, yes. just to see what happened. Yeah. But, but what happened was, of course, disaster. It was. So the, what was the motive behind the question of the motive behind their request to go in and spy it out was so we can map out the land and we can attack and, and really be effective in going in to conquer and do it with, uh, with foresight and, and real wisdom. But they use this opportunity as to decide, do we really want to go in and do this? Hmm. And, um, and that, was, uh, that was caused from fear. And, and uh, fear and faith can never dwell together. Hmm. They are enemies of one another. Yeah, yeah fear, fear is what stuck out to me the most. It was fear... Um, and, and how it plays a hand in our own downfall. Yes, uh, it th does. This is, this, is what, this is what stuck out to me the most. There, there are other things in the portion that, uh, toward the end, but at the beginning, fear uh, and, and what it does to keep us from entering the land, mm. the literal land and the, and the, and the spiritual, spiritual land, land. Yes. Um, is of utmost, utmost importance. Yes. Um, so let's go ahead and okay. read through uh, this passage, um, starting... Uh, where do you want to start? 13, just the beginning of 13? Um, or, how about if we... Or we, we want yeah. to jump to... Maybe verse 17. 17. Would be a good place. Okay. Why don't you go ahead? Oh, okay. Moses sent them to explore the land of Canaan. It's not the word spy. It's the word to explore. And he said to them, Ascend here in the south and climb the mountain. See the land. How is it? And the people that dwells in it. Is it strong or weak? Is it few or numerous? And how is the land in which it dwells? Is it good or is it bad? And how are the cities in which it dwells? Are they open or are they fortified? And how is the land? Is it fertile or is it lean? Is there a tree in it or not? That is how the Hebrew is actually translated. 
And the rabbis make much of that. Why do you ask if there was a tree in it? What kind of tree is he talking about? So that's something to talk about. Which is interesting because in my translation, it says, are there trees? Yes. Plural. Most, most translations do that. Yeah. But in the Hebrew, it's singular. Hmm. But anyways, <laughs> you shall strengthen yourselves and take from the fruit of the land. The days were the season of the first ripe grapes. They ascended and explored the land from the wilderness of Zin to the expanse of the approach to Hamat. They ascended in the south, and he arrived at Hebron. And the he is believed to be Caleb, uh, because Hebron was later inherited by Caleb, uh, where there were uh, Achiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the offspring of the giant. Hebron had been built seven years before Zon of Egypt. They arrived at the valley of Eshkol and cut from there a vine with one cluster of grapes and bore it on a double pole and of the pomegranates and of the figs. They named that place the Valley of Eshkol, which means cluster, because of the cluster that the children of Israel cut from there. They turned from exploring the land at the end of 40 days. They went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to the entire assembly of the children of Israel, to the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and brought back the report to them and the entire assembly, and they showed them the fruit of the land. They reported to him and said, We arrived at the land to which you sent us, and indeed it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. And that's where they should have shut their yaps, <laughs> and, and everybody would have cheered and applauded and said, Look at the grapes <laughs> and the pomegranates. Verse 26, But, mm. uh, and the moment Ouch. they said that word, they shot themselves in the foot. Ephes is the word, and, and um, the rabbis talk about that word, ephes, but if that word, that little three-letter word, was their downfall. Mm -hmm. their, their future and their lives hinged on that word right there. And uh, so many times we'll talk about something great, we'll be optimistic, but, and the moment we say but, we're going from light to dark, we're going from positive to negative, we're going from faith to fear. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we go from being a believer to being an idolater. Because mm -hmm. we elevate fear. And what controls us and what we give our fear to is our God. Mm -hmm. And the moment they said, Ephes, they revealed who their God was. It says, the people that dwells in the land is powerful. The cities are very greatly fortified. They could have just said fortified. But they put uh, Gadol mode very greatly. We also saw there the offspring of the giant. Amalek dwells in the area of the south. The Hittite, the Jebusite, and the Amorite dwell on the mountain. And the Canaanite dwells by the sea on the bank of the Jordan. So you, you had said that if, if they had stopped there, yeah. they would have been good. I, I would say that even if they had kept going, save for that word, FS, yeah. it still would have been a good report because, so. because I believe God was allowing them to see, to witness yeah. how it was he was going to move with a mighty hand on their behalf. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you read it, we went into the land where you sent us and certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. The people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large, and moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Knowing that God was going to lead us there yeah, and, and give it an to awesome us. awesome land. Look at the people. Look. At, look. Wow. Well, well look. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a mighty enemy. Yeah. God is going to bring us in there and yeah. he's going to defeat them for us. Yeah. Like, like it's still, it still could have been in a, in a positive light. Yeah giving glory to God for yeah. allowing us to come into the land despite all these things. Yeah. That would have still been a good thing, Absolutely. except for that word. Yeah, that one word. It's mm. so disappointing. It <laughs> certainly is. <laughs> and every time, every time you read it, you know, I, I heard somebody say, every time you, every time you come to it, you're, you wish that they don't say it, but yeah. you know what's coming. Yeah. It's like, maybe this time when I read it, they're not going <laughs> to say they go it. In. They're, just, they're going to go in. They're going to uh, see that, that, that no, yeah. every time, every yeah. time they do that. Yeah, that's for sure. So, so here's a question. What, what brings more glory to God? And this is, a, you know, this is an obvious question. What brings more glory to God? When, when we 
bring about something that we believe we could do on our own, mm -hmm. or when something happens on our behalf that we know we could never do on our own, but is done by God. No, knowing that it is all God, yeah. God brings about everything. Yeah. We do nothing on our own. But there are certain things that we think, oh, okay, well, that, that really was me. I was able to do that. Yeah. But there are things that, that happened that I could have never done on my own, yeah. but God delivered for me. What brings God more glory? Probably the second. Probably That's the second. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because we, with, this, with the, the latter case, I don't have any faith in myself. Mm -hmm. So all my faith is placed in Him. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we are always going to be tested in that regard. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes we fail. You know, I was saying earlier to you, I wish people who were fearful would quit calling themselves believers. And I think most people call themselves believers, they believe in the theology, and they believe in the scriptures, and they believe all these things, but when it comes down to testing them themselves, they're not a believer anymore. Mm. So they're believers in theory, but atheists in practice. I would, I would say it a little differently. I would say that they, they may be people of faith, but not people of trust. They yeah, have faith yes. that, that God is yeah. in control, but yeah. they don't trust that what God will bring about will be good for, them. for us. Yeah. Right. Well put. Yeah, so that, that's, yeah, that's how I would put it. Yeah. If, I'd, <laughs> right. if I'd thought, and say, <laughs> go back and say it again. <laughs> so going, going back to this, with, with God's glory, with, with the two different ways in which God will bring about his glory no yeah. matter what we do or don't do, we're being shown through his promise how it is he's going to deliver us, how he's going to mm -hmm. triumph for us mightily. Yeah. And, and it's all about him. Everything yeah. is always about him and yeah. anything that happens. Yeah, that's for sure. So what, what has happened for the Israelites is that they have experienced in their infancy as a nation open miracles, yes. like huge things that they obviously could not have done yeah. on their own. But in order for them to move to a place where they are participating with God mm -hmm. in preparing the world to be his dwelling place, right. they, they must be brought into the process. They, must, right. they must get used to being, to being the vehicle or the conduits yes. for those, for those right. miracles. Yeah. And the key there is the word infancy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you're an infant, um, you cry and someone changes your diaper. You cry, someone feeds you. You cry, someone picks you up and comforts you and plays with you. Mm -hmm. well, and it's all done for you. And that's how God was with the Israelites. He worked these miracles, provided water, provided food, provided shade, provided light, protection, and, it was just, and manna, just this constant provision. And to continue doing that, they remain spectators, mm -hmm. but they never become real participants and partners with God. Yeah. So he wants them to grow up. And of course, in the book of Joshua, once they cross the, the Jordan River, the miracle stopped. But then I always think they didn't really stop. They became more internalized mm. because rain coming out of the sky is still a miracle mm -hmm. and seeds growing crops is still a miracle. Mm -hmm. And the way God would, would strengthen them to fight their enemies, it's still miraculous. Mm -hmm. But it's, they're more of a participant in it. It's not mm -hmm. being done just for them without any input of their own. So uh, growing pains, it's, it's painful to grow from this utter dependency without me doing anything to where God says, okay, now you learn to walk. Get up mm -hmm. on your feet and walk with me. Yeah. And, and I, I always like to um, remember how to define a miracle and, and what, it, what are miracles. Yeah. You know? People will have different opinions about, oh, it's something that you know, I can't explain or, or mm -hmm. whatever. And I remember learning that everything is a miracle because of the, of the one miracle that occurred, which was creation. Right. Creation was the miracle. Yeah. And because of that, everything is a miracle. It is. The difference here is that there were open and obvious mm -hmm. miracles to the eye, to the senses. Yes. But then there are, that when those go away, they're the ones yeah. that are not quite so open, that are deeper. That's right. 
closer, more personal, yes. and require uh, a concentration to see. That's right. But, but it is all miracle. That's right. And it all brings glory to God. Well, you know, Yeshua said that uh, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. We love, I mean, who doesn't like seeing God work a miracle, do some mm -hmm. uh, great healing or whatever it is, some miraculous act. We all love that. Mm -hmm. But the truly spiritual person sees the miraculous in the everyday. He, he doesn't see anything. That to him, he doesn't see God present in that. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of deep relationship God's calling us to. Mm -hmm. So if only we could see God's hand in everything, see him everywhere and in everything, that's what a spiritual man does. To that point, I think, and this, this will, this will uh, help us to move on here, is that we always want to see miracles. We want to see mm -hmm. things happen. Yeah. But we're not so keen on ourselves being the instrument of that miracle because that requires us to trust. Mm -hmm requires us to take risk That's uh, right. or perceived risk, whether yes. real or perceived. Mm -hmm. That requires us. If we're Absolutely. going to be, if we're going to yep. be how God sh shares a miracle, we're, we're like, ah, let it be someone else. That's and right. I can point to it and say, I serve that God yes. instead of it being ourselves. Yeah. And why is that? Fear. Mm -hmm. Fear of Fear. something we're going to lose, mm -hmm. right? Going back to the point of God wanting to dwell in, uh, dwell in creation, because that, that was the plan then and it is the plan now. Mm -hmm. God wants to dwell here. When we fear going into the land, uh, we are, we're going counter to the plan. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is not to fear the world, but enter it and transform it. That's right. We need to go into the land Tikkun. despite despite all of what we perceive to be obstacles to God's plan, go in enter it, transform it, and make it into the dwelling place of God. That's right. Yep. Yes. Well, I think we're at verse 30. Go ahead. Caleb, Chalev. And by the way, whenever I see the name Caleb, and of course we named our, second, our two sons, are Joshua and Caleb, based on the story in the book of Joshua as well. But Caleb... Um, his, the name means dog, <laughs> but the spelling Kalev can mean kol lev, whole heart, mm -hmm. wholehearted. And, uh, and of course, Joshua, his name is Yeshua, salvation. And he's a picture of our Yeshua. So when you take the two names together, Caleb and Joshua, there's a wholeheartedness, but there's also Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And these are two things we have to have. Some people have Yeshua, but they're not wholehearted. Mm -hmm. Some people are wholehearted, I think, of a lot of the Jewish people, but they don't know Yeshua yet. Mm -hmm. So when you're wholehearted and you have Yeshua both, these are the ones that go into the land, and they do it in style. Yeah. Have you ever had a dog? Oh, well, yeah. yeah, sure, oh, Oscar. yeah. Oscar, that's right. Oscar of had, blessed I, memory. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a dog named Tramp. Yeah. Which we named him Tramp because the, the neighbor's dog was Lady. So Lady yeah. and the Tramp, right? And one thing that, one thing that always marked is, is, is an indicator of, of a dog or you know, yeah. a characteristic of a dog is their fearlessness. Yes. Like their absolute fearlessness. Yeah. There's a video. There's a whole bunch of videos yeah. of dogs like chasing and barking after bears or yes. lions. I mean, right. just like they just don't care. Yeah. They don't give a hoot. They're yeah. just, they are yeah. fully in it. Full-hearted, they're they're fearless, yes. and and in that sense, we need to be more absolutely. like dogs. Absolutely, absolutely. Um. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, <laughs> a little rabbi trail there. Caleb silenced the people toward Moses and said, "Now we're not told that they got all." uppity and, and yelling and upset mm -hmm. between 29 and 30. Mm -hmm. Well, we can assume that they did because otherwise they didn't need silence. Well, what's interesting too is that they, they brought back a report not simply to Moses and Aaron, but in front yes. of everyone. I think that's, that's yes. important too. Knowing they, what it... Knowing yeah. what they would have said, what mm -hmm. they were going to say, to yeah. make sure they have a larger audience mm -hmm. that was calculated. Very devious, yeah. yeah. So Caleb says, we shall surely ascend and conquer. And he did, for we can surely do it. And again, he did. He and Joshua did, and the children of this generation did. Caleb speaks eight words. That's all he speaks. 
Verse 31, but the men, or it should be, and the men who ascended with him said, we cannot ascend. Now there's just open rebellion. Up to this point, they're given a report, a negative report, but now they're simply saying, God is wrong, we're right, we cannot ascend to that people, for it is too strong for us. Mm -hmm. Well, of course it's too mm -hmm. strong for them. That's true. Well, it's not That's too still strong true. for God. That's still true. But they brought <laughs> forth to the children of Israel an evil report on the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have passed to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the But they just spent 40 days there. They didn't get devoured, yeah. but anyways. All the people that we saw in it were huge. There we saw the Nephilim, the sons of the giant from among the Nephilim. We were like grasshopper in our eyes, and so were, we were in their eyes. There are several lies that we could pick mm -hmm. out in verses 32 mm -hmm. and 33, mm -hmm. but I think we should leave that to the people for their discussion. If you can find the distortions and lies in what they just said. Well, I do want to, I do want to bring something up here too, mm -hmm. and, that, and, and one of the lies is that... Um, and so we were in their sight. That is not true. We know that that's not true. Yeah. The Canaanites, the people in the land, were, were afraid, afraid yes. of the people of God. Absolutely. We know this from, we, from the Song of the Sea. Exodus, Exodus 15, yeah. 14 through 16. This is an Exodus. When the peoples hear, they will tremble. Anguish will seize the inhabitants of Philistia. Mm -hmm. Then the chiefs of Edom are terrified. Trembling grips Moab's mighty men. All of Canaan's inhabitants will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they become yeah. still as a stone till your people cross over, Adonai, till the people whom you purchased cross yeah. over. And then again in Joshua, Joshua yeah. chapter 2. What this is a generation later uh, uh, due to God's mighty acts at the Red Sea, yeah. right? Joshua 2, 9 through 11. And she said to the men, I know that Adonai has given you the land. Yeah. Dread of you has fallen on us, and all the inhabitants of the land are melting in fear before you. <laughs> For we have heard how Adonai dried up the water of the, yeah. Red, of the Sea of Reeds before you, went, uh, before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we yeah. heard about it, our hearts melted, and no mm -hmm. spirit remained any more in anyone because of you. For Adonai, yes. your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Yeah. So the thing that they were fearing, they, they couldn't see that or the, the enemy could have also feared them because yeah, of, of their course. position as being the yeah. children of the living God. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> And what's, what, here's one of the bold-faced lies. Everybody will catch it anyway. But it talks about earlier in the report, talk about the people there are huge. They're, they're, they're massive. But then it says here, oh, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. Well, wait a minute. Which is it? <laughs> is it devouring its inhabitants? Is it, is it someplace where people just can't live? Or are the people there healthy and huge because it's such a great land flowing with Bill Canani? Mm -hmm. And... Um, but fear makes us liars because fear basically says there is no God, or at least he doesn't care for us. And that's a huge lie. And so that big lie leads to a bunch of little lies. Mm -hmm. And again, in this passage here, it can all still have been in a positive light if it was framed uh, with the fact that God will deliver us. Yes. You could even say, the inhabitants are huge, the, 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 yeah. the land will devour us, yeah. but God will deliver us there. Like that's yeah. the right but. That yes. is a correct but. Which is what Caleb and, and Joshua <laughs> and said. And they were trying yes. to do. Yeah. Also, here's something interesting too. And I, I don't know what the percentage is because I don't know what the percentage of 12, 10 is, but yeah. 12 people go in, 10 people bring back a negative report to bring a positive. This has got to be a picture of, of us, mm -hmm. how the, maj the, the majority of ourselves will fear. Yes. But there's, there, is a, there is a small percentage, a supernatural percentage yeah. of, of our soul yeah. that still believes that this is possible and that God will deliver yeah. us. And that is our battle every yeah. day when yes. we're facing things, is that yeah. nature would say that we should fear this. We should not go. It yeah. doesn't make sense. It's not logical. 
but there's the super, the, mm -hmm. the, the better than our nature part of ourselves. That's right. That must still insist and fight for the truth that God is with us. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Well put. Well, we're in ver chapter 14. The entire assembly raised up and issued its voice. The people wept that night. All the children of Israel murmured against, Adon against Moses and Aaron. And later it talks about the sin of murmuring in the tents. Mm -hmm. They get their little family units and they just keep feeding the fear, feeding the fear, mm -hmm. let their imaginations. Mm -hmm. Which reminds me, I have to share this quote. I was sharing it with you earlier. Watchman Nee, uh, in one of his books, he says, a uh, beloved counselor used to say to me, fear is Satan's calling card. Fear is Satan's calling card. Whenever you accept his calling card, you will receive a visit from him. Fear him and he comes. Fear not and he is held at a distance. Mm -hmm. So uh, fear is Satan's calling card. They accepted that fear and the enemy showed up in a, in a huge way. If you fear it. It, will, it come. will come. Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> I'd rather fear God and have Him come. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You fear God, you're not afraid of anything else. Yeah. There's, there's, oh. there are different types of fear here too. Uh, so there's the, there's the fear of failure, obviously. Yeah. Um, but if we, so if we fear failure, we will fail. Yeah. But if we're willing to fail, then we will succeed. Willing to risk it. Yeah. There's, that, there's sure. this. I don't know what that, 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 that kind of mirroring is, yeah. but, that, but it's true. If we yeah. fear death, we will die. Yeah, if we'll we're willing to die, mm -hmm. we will live, yeah. right? Um, in Matthew, Matthew 10, 24 to 42, speaks of this a little bit, especially in verse 39, um, but I'll, I'll read through 24 through 42. Uh, a Talmud is not greater than his rabbi. A slave is not greater than his master. It is enough for a Talmud that he become like his rabbi and a slave like his master. Now, if people have called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign the members of his household? So do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will, be, that will not be uncovered or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are powerless to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in Gehinnom. Aren't sparrows sold for next to nothing, two for, a, a, for an Assyrian? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's consent. As for you, every hair in your head has been counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me in the presence of others, I will also acknowledge in the presence of my Father in heaven. So here's, here's kind of an allusion, too, to the spies coming back in, mm -hmm. the, in the midst of the congregation. Yes. Whoever acknowledges me in the presence of others, which they did not do, yeah. I will also acknowledge in the presence of my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven, mm -hmm. which is what happened. Yes, it is. Don't suppose that I have come to bring peace to the land... It is not peace I have come to bring, but a sword. God was going to bring a sword yes. to the land. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law <coughs> against her mother-in-law, so that a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Mm -hmm. Whoever loves his father or mother more than he loves me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than he loves me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his execution stake and follow me is not worthy of me. And verse 39. Whoever finds his own life will lose, lose it, it, but the person who loses his life for my sake will find it. Yeah. What the, if, if failure is what they feared in going mm -hmm. to the land, I have to give them the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. that they thought they were saving the lives yeah. of the people. Yes. That yeah. they thought, the, the, the task they were given was to get information. Yeah. Just find out information and come back. That's right. What they ended up believing was that they were advisors now and that they were decision makers in this because they were leaders in their tribes. They thought, oh, let's go out. And they, in those 40 days in the walk back or whatever, they probably were talking like, oh, you know, we, we, he needs us to help him with the decision. And so they thought that they would be giving life to their children, yeah. life to the nation by 
keeping us from going or keeping yeah. them from going into the land. Yeah. But that is, is the opposite so of what was happening. Yeah, the, you know, it's this whole self-preservation thing. Um, you know, there's a natural biological self-preservation of someone's driving on the sidewalk in a car. I want to jump out of the way. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to these big things, these spiritual things, self-preservation is not my responsibility because I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Mm -hmm. he'll, he'll preserve me. But if I am focused on self-preservation, I won't take risks. I'll always be fearful and I'll always be a slave. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, in verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he, Yeshua himself, likewise also partook of the same, that through death, he might render powerless him who had the might of death, that is, the devil, and might free all those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Hmm. If we have this fear of death, we'll be slaves our whole lives. I'd rather trust in Yeshua who's conquered death. Mm -hmm. Don't have to be afraid of death. Mm -hmm. Don't have to worry about n taking risks. Because I belong with him. My life is hid with Messiah and God. I, I can't be more secure than that. Mm -hmm. And this is something that Joshua and Caleb got. Their faith was in God. Not in their enemy's ability to destroy them, but in God's ability to, to do what he said he would do. But again, they're still, and, and the, the, this is, this is I, I'm, I'm learning this. I'm, I've got a long way to go. It is still good to recognize that the enemy, that your enemy could mm -hmm. kill you. Mm -hmm. But that is where we as believers, yeah. as people who have faith and trust, should then praise yes. God yes. for how he will deliver us mightily in the yes. face of this. That's right. It, what is not only, not, not only is perceived to be mm -hmm. real, but could also be real yeah. that we could die at the hand of the enemy. Yeah. Like, oh, praise God that we're not going to. <laughs> That's Yeah. Oh, I know. Yes. So earlier in uh, the second chapter of Hebrews, um, starting in verse 8, I'll just read down and stop where you mm -hmm. uh, came oh, in at 14. I had the same yeah. passage here, yes. Great minds. Oh, That's right. I yeah. know. Yes, look at us. <laughs> <laughs> in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing unsus unsubjected to him. However, at present, we don't see everything subjected to him, at least not yet. But we do see Yeshua, who indeed yes. was made for a little while lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by God's great he might taste death for all humanity. For in bringing many sons to glory, it was only fitting that God, the creator and preserver of everything, should bring the initiator of their deliverance to the goal through sufferings. Yes. For both Yeshua, who sets people apart for God, and the ones being set apart have a common origin. This is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers when he says, and this is from mm -hmm. Psalms, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Mm -hmm. Also, in, from Isaiah chapter 8, I will put my trust in him. And then it goes on, and uh, that was 8 verse 17. This is Isaiah 8 verse 18. Here I am, along with the children of God, the children God has given me. And then the verse mm -hmm. that you read. Therefore, since the children share a common physical nature right. as human beings, etc. Praise, trust, gratitude. Mm -hmm. Praise, trust, gratitude. Death has been conquered. Yeah. And we should be willing to die. Yeah. That is a part of life. Sure. But we, in the midst of the congregation, in the midst of the people, coming and giving a good yeah. report. Yeah. Praise Him. Trust in Him. Despite what we see with our eyes and hear with our ears and, and sense mm -hmm. everything. Trust in Him. Yeah. And then be grateful for the people He has surrounded us with. Yes. This is the pattern for dealing with our fear. Mm. That's right. No, we don't think of this. We just think fear is so natural. It's just how we're wired. And it is. But fear is also a sin because I don't know of any commandment that is reiterated more than the commandment, fear not. So when we disobey that commandment, we are sinning. We're telling God he's a liar 
and that what is right in my own eyes, this is the truth. And uh, fear, to operate in fear and to submit to fear is sin. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. And I think we could all have examples in our own lives where we followed our fears and what a mess that was. Oh, yeah, every day. Every in fact, that's kind of what happens here, isn't it? Yeah, every day. Yeah. Um, I, I, I went back and looked in Isaiah chapter 8 to see if there was more there. Uh, and there is a couple verses. So if in Hebrews mm -hmm. he's quoting uh, Isaiah 8, 17, from Isaiah 8, 17 and 8, 18. Um, I looked at the whole chapter, and in verses 12 and 13, there's, there's, uh, he goes into it a little bit more. Um, and, and I think this is important uh, when we consider uh, Joshua and Caleb as part of this group, mm -hmm. right? Isaiah 8, 12. Don't regard as alliance what this people calls alliance, and don't fear what they fear or be awestruck by it. But Adonai of hosts, Adonai Tzavot, consecrate him, let him be the object of your fear and awe. Mm -hmm. And then in 17 and 18, I will wait for Adonai who is hiding his face from the house of, of Yaakov. Yes, I will look for him. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I and the children whom Adonai has given me will become for Israel signs and wonders from Adonai of hosts living on Mount Zion. So here, here it is again, when uh, I said earlier, we don't want to be the, the, the sign and wonder that people look mm -hmm. to, that's, that's scary. Yeah. But here it is, so he has given me, will become for Israel signs and wonders. We will become mm -hmm. the signs and wonders to the nations yeah. who will then look to us and mm -hmm. say, that is, is a people uh, who serves a good God. Yes. Yes. But that's scary. That's oh, terrifying. It's, scary. it's terrifying. Yeah, it is. <laughs> As it should be. Yeah. But we, yeah. we can still, we can still yeah. conquer it. We can. Well, should we pick up where we left off? Sure. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, I shouldn't laugh because it's not funny, but it's <laughs> like, I just feel like, I'm like you. It's like, maybe this time they'll, they'll go in, but I'm reading it. No, it still says the same thing it did before. Um. So they, they uh, issued their vo its voice, they wept all night, they murmured in their tents. Which, just to pause you there, there yeah. uh, it's, a, it's tradition to believe that that night was Tishba Av. Mm. Yeah. And that this is, this Av, is yeah. where the ninth of Av, where, where the spirit of the ninth of Av was yes. sealed. Yes. And all the things that have happened oh, throughout the centuries that on that yes. day, it started here on that night. So, in the middle of verse 2, they say, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, which they're going to, by the way, why is Adonai bringing us to this land to die by the sword? Our wives and young children will be taken captive. Is it not better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us appoint a leader, and let us return to Egypt. Now, we, we've seen this happen once before, and I think it's interesting. Um, so where have we seen this before? Israelites desire to return to Egypt. God threatens to destroy the Israelites and make a new nation from Moses. Moses intercedes. God relents. The instigators are killed, because that's what's happening in this passage. And the place this happened was with the golden calf. And when you compare what happened with the golden calf and what happened here with this evil report, this is worse. This is worse than the idolatry of the golden calf. And you can discuss why that is, but here I've laid it out side by side some of the parallels between the golden calf story and this story. But this was far more serious. But we'll go on. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the entire congregation of the assembly of the children of Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Yephune, of the spies of the land, tore their garments. So they're going into grief because they realize what's about to happen. They spoke to the entire assembly of the children of Israel, saying, The land that we passed through to spy it out, the land is very, very good. If Adonai desires us, he will bring us to this land and give it to us. Now, I don't remember the spies ever mentioning God. Mm -hmm. They talked about the giants, mm -hmm. 
and the cities mm-hmm. and, and all of that. But they had forgotten God. But Joshua mm-hmm. and Caleb bring God into the picture. And they, and they talk about the land. Yes. It's Just very, the very land. good. The land. Yeah. If Adonai desires us, he will bring us to this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. But do not rebel against Adonai. You should not fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Because the spies had said, um, we, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. And, but Josh and Caleb were saying, no, we'll devour them. Hmm. Their protection has departed from them. Adonai is with us. Do not fear them. But the entire assembly said to pelt them with stones. And I, I love this phrase. When we fail to engage our spiritual enemies, we will attack our spiritual friends. And that is something we see happening throughout the scriptures. And you know, it's things, something we'll experience in our own life. When we do engage our spiritual enemies, then our friends become our, our comrades. Mm-hmm. But when we fail to engage our spiritual enemies, we will attack those mm-hmm. who are our friends. But the entire assembly said to pelt them with stones, and the glory of Adonai appeared. All of a sudden, God shows up. He says, it's like, this is enough. It's like <laughs> when my brother and I were kids, we'd be bouncing on the beds at night, don't make me come in there. And we keep cutting up and finally that door opened and there's dad standing at the door just like, oops, we went a little <laughs> too far. I think that's probably the feeling that people had like, uh-oh, we yeah. really went too people far. People taking a bite of food and then they just stop. Like, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Adonai said to Moses, how long would this people... Now, I don't know how your translation has it. The uh, stone coma says provoke. But the word there in Hebrew, noatz, means despise. How long will this people despise me? Despise me. And then again, uh, a little later in uh, chapter 14, um, in verse 23, he says it again. If they will see the land that I have sworn to give their forefathers and all who despise me shall not see it. Now, how is it that the people could despise God? And I think what happens, and I want to hear what you you think about this. I think what happens is we love this God we imagine in our minds. But when we meet the real God, we despise the real God because he doesn't cooperate with us. The God we have in our minds always cooperates with us because whatever I want, well, that happens to be his will too because how could he not want what I want? Because what's good in my eyes is good and God wants good. And so we love the God of our imagination, but often the God of our imagination is not the real God of the universe. Mm -hmm. And when the real God of the universe intercedes, and has something that's different from what we imagine our God wanting, we despise the real God because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts aren't our thoughts. Hmm. I think it's kind of what happened here. I don't know. So Yeah, I I would agree with that. I don't know that I could say it any better, but, but, you know, if I'm, when I was courting my wife, uh, and even now, um, I wanted to do what she wanted. Um, now, do I always do the dishes when she asks? Of course. No, of course. I don't. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> but in my love for her, I do, I, I obey her. Yeah. Yeah. So in not obeying God, that mm. is, that is where, the, yeah. the, where the, the spurning or, or the dis, despise, yeah. despisement, is that the word? Anyway, where, where that, how, that, is, how yeah. that plays out. It's just ignoring, basically ignoring yeah. him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I agree that you know we, we have this idea of what God is and what God wants for us, yeah. and then when God actually speaks to us, what He yeah. does want, yeah. we don't like it. No. Yeah. No. We so don't I would like agree it. with that. So He asks God asks this question: How long will this people despise me? And next second question: How long will they not have faith in me? Ah. Uh. They didn't have faith. And because they had fear, they couldn't have faith. They can't have both. Mm. Despite all the signs that I performed in their midst, 
I will smite them with a plague and annihilate them, and I shall make you a greater, more powerful nation than they. Moses said to Adonai, Then Egypt, from whose midst you brought us, brought up this nation with uh, your might, will hear, and they will say about the inhabitants of this land, They have heard that you, Adonai, are in the midst of this land, that you, Adonai, appeared eye to eye, and your cloud stands over them, and that in a pillar of cloud you go before them by day, and in a pillar of fire at night. Yet you killed this people like a single man. Then the nations that heard of your fame will say, because Adonai lacked the ability to bring this people to the land that he had sworn to give them, he slaughtered them in the wilderness. And now may the strength of my Lord be magnified as you have spoken, saying, Adonai, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, forgiver of iniquity and willful sin, and who cleanses but does not cleanse completely, recalling the iniquity of parents upon children to the third and fourth generations. Now, where have we heard that before? What is Moses quoting here? Do you recognize that? I uh, I recognize it, but I don't. It's the thirteen away. attributes of mercy from Exodus uh, thirty-two. Mm -hmm. God or Moses asked to see God's glory, and God said, "I'll make all my goodness pass before you." And then he reveals these 13 attributes of his mercy. Mm. So Moses is now reminding God of his attributes of mercy. And, um, and what a powerful way to pray is simply to review God's attributes before him. Mm. And I think God loves this because Moses loved God. Mm -hmm. And he loved him because of these things he mentions here. And so in verse 19, he makes his request, Forgive now the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your kindness, and as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. And Adonai said, I have forgiven because of your words. And what we see in Moses here is a picture of Yeshua. He's interceding for the people. And because God is going to make the people suffer in the wilderness for 40 years, Moses is going to suffer along with them and die with them in the wilderness. Verse 21, God continues, But as I live and the glory of Adonai shall fill the entire world, that all the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tested me these ten times have not heeded my voice if they will see the land that I have sworn to give their forefathers. And all who despise me shall not see it, except my servant Caleb, because a different spirit was with him, and he followed me wholeheartedly. There's that wholehearted. Mm -hmm. I shall bring him to the land to which he came, and his offspring shall possess it. The Amalekite and the Canaanite dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and journey toward the wilderness in the direction of the Sea of Reeds. And do we want to pause there? Sure. What do you have to say? <laughs> well, there is, there's, another, there's, there's another... I could just tell you I had something percolating to share. So oh, that's I, I've always got something percolating. Okay, well, all right. It, it's Percolate not, away. It's not always tasteful. <laughs> <laughs> there's another uh, perspective that I read about um, that was uh, Rabbi Schneerson. Mm-hmm. Um, who had had a spin on this uh, that was interesting? And just speaking of fear, because this is this is this is the topic of the day, um, that they may have feared success. Mm. So how 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 would that have been a bad thing? So if if God's plan is to dwell among us, mm -hmm. and His plan is to elevate the mundane, right, to, to the holy, then their experience in the wilderness would come to an end. Yes. And why is that a bad thing? Well, in the wilderness, we are closer to God. At least we perceive a closeness to God that we may lose by going back to work mm -hmm. or going back into the world. Yeah. And and so what they what they perceived is that they would succeed, that they would be a nation, 
a nation that had to engage in mm -hmm. political and economic and social and all these different kinds of things with people, something that they had witnessed happen in Egypt yeah. in a negative light. But they're now going to go do it, which means the open miracles may come to an end. Yeah. And, um, and, and Rabbi Schneerson says this, this, is the, this is the danger of, of very holy men. Mm -hmm. The, the people who want to, uh, to go away, to, to live a monastic lifestyle. Yes. They just want to go and yeah. they just want to focus on God and, and lift ourselves up onto, onto the mountaintop instead of doing what God wants and that's bringing Him down mm -hmm. into the land. That's, that's right. what He wants. That's what yes. He's working toward. And it's selfish then to keep that from happening yeah. so that we can keep this kind of spiritual high, this, yeah. this direct connection with Him. Yeah. The Sabbath is only one day a week, mm -hmm. right? Yes. It's not every day. We have to go in. We have to work. We yeah. have to work the land. We have to do our yeah. jobs. We have to bring about repair and healing to the world. Yeah. And, then, and then we have a day in which we are closer to Him yes. and have this spiritual connection and nothing else. Yeah. But that, that, that is, I thought that was a very interesting, yeah. and, and that, that, that's a, a, a psychoanalytical type of, of perspective, but it's, it's still, any of the fears are possible. Yes, that's right. Um, but it's still fear, yeah. and we need to, we need to get, it, get rid of it. It's like that child who, for the first few years of life, it's all been fun and games, and then finally the day comes when mom and dad say, it's time for you to start doing some chores. Right, yeah. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah Jeff, like, Jeffrey's. We're we're doing pretty good with our kids, yeah. but they're reluctant. You know, they want help. Here's what happens. <laughs> we're 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 trying to you know set up an atmosphere where if you're, this is what the Pels do. Yeah, when we're, done eating, do. when we're done eating, when we're done eating, we take our dishes into the yes. sink. When we're done in the living room, we put the toys away, and he'll do it, only if I help him. Right. Uh -huh. So he's, so he's learning. So it's, it's, I was doing it all for him. What I want is for him to yeah. do it all himself because yes. he made the mess. If he can yeah. make the mess, he can surely clean it up. Yeah. But that's maybe unrealistic. Where we're at right now is that he can yeah. only take that step forward, do that action, yeah. if I'm there along with him and yeah. he sees me doing it. Right. So that's like the second stage. And that's, yeah. that's where God was trying to get them into. Right. Um, and where we may still be before going into the third stage, which is we, we just do what we're told yeah. and we do it with cheerfulness and vigilance. Yes. Yeah, that's well put. I'm reminded of that passage in 1 John. It's a very kind of cryptic passage. In fact, let me just read it. Because there are three stages of spiritual development and maturity. And John spells them out for us. And somebody moved John. Where did it go to? Here we are. It's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. He says, I am writing to you, little children, that's stage one, because your sins have been forgiven, forgiven you for his name's sake. And that's where we all start. Oh, God has saved me. He's forgiven my sins. He's delivered me. And I've been and born again. I'm Israel has been forgiven for... Moses' namesake, mm -hmm. because of his yes. faith. Yeah. And then he says, I am writing to you fathers. He skips from the first up to the top level, the third level of maturity, because you know him who has been from the beginning. But then he hits the middle level. I am writing to you young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, and then he reviews this. I have written to you children because you know the Father, just like Jeffrey wants to spend time with you. I'll do my chores if I'm there with you. I am writing to you fathers. Uh, did I skip? I think I skipped back. Uh, verse 14, I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the evil one. Mm. So with children, it's just... They're forgiven, and they, they know their Abba. Mm -hmm. With young men, they're learning to flex their muscles and defeat the evil one using God's Word. Whose calling card is fear. Fear, yeah. yes. 
And, uh, but fathers, he says the same thing to them both times, because you've known him who is from the beginning. In other words, you know God's heart, and you've connected with him. In many ways, you become a father as well. You are now discipling and raising up people. Um, and those three stages, I, I, they're always in my mind. When, I, when, I, I, when people come to me and they want advice and when I read stories like this, and growing from one stage to the next is often a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Most people think once they become young men, now I'm mature. Mm -hmm. Now God says, there's one more step, yeah. and that's to become a father like me. And you know me, the one who's from the very beginning, to know the very essence of what makes God tick, to know his heart. And... Um, it wasn't until I became a father that I really connected with my earthly father. Mm -hmm. And we really became close. I never thought it would happen. Mm -hmm. No, we had, I had respect for him, I had fear of him, and I loved him, but we are never really close until I became a dad. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden we connected. It was, it was an amazing thing. God wants that for all of us as well. Mm -hmm. So anyhow. So good, so good. Should we just kind of review what happens as if people don't know already? Um, yeah, let's do that, and then, we, and then we can probably wrap up. Well, the 10 spies, <clears throat> boom, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're just <laughs> snuffed mm -hmm. um, in verse 36. But as for the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land and who returned and provoked the entire assembly against him by spreading a report against the land, the people who spread the evil report about the land died in a plague before Adonai. So those 10 guys, they're done. But Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Yephunneh, lived from among those men who were going to spy out the land. And so the next 40 years are going to be spent digging graves. And I forget how many hundreds of people died on average every day for the next, mm -hmm. I guess it'd be actually about 38 years. And uh, they just spent the next almost four decades dying. And the children who these spies were fearful for are the ones who go in and take the land and kill the giants. They conquer the cities and uh, they, they do all, all the stuff. Now here's one of the questions and I don't have an answer for it. Um, did the women die over the 40 years or was it just the men? And a lot of the rabbis believe that the women did not die during these 40 years. I mean some I'm sure did from old age or whatever. But it was that generation of men who had to die, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. But the women may very well have lived. Hmm. And so the wives of the children, who the men were fear fearful for, are the ones who went in and took the land. So I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know if it's worth debating, but it's worth thinking about mm -hmm. and, and leaving that option open, because it might be the case. We have two minutes left. Well, I think we could probably come to an end. Okay. Um, the, the main point, I would say, is to remember that we are not to fear this world, but to enter it and transform it. Yes. And anything we face that would cause uh, an unbelieving person to fear should be what causes us to praise our God and rejoice mm. in His might Amen. and how He delivers us. Whatever it is, in work, in, in relationships, mm. in our congregations, in, in anything, fear, fear is always an option, but, and, and we will fear, but we need to remember where to place that fear in a healthy way, and that is fear of God. Right. Fear of God, the one who can, who can destroy the body and the soul. Yeah. Right. He is the only one who can, who who we should be fearing. Yes. Uh, but then also to 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 understand our purpose, God's God's call for us, to help prepare the world, mm -hmm. to be His dwelling place, yes. and that's that's a good work, right. and it's something to be excited about. That's right. Well put. That's a great summary for this passage. Yeah. Well, we have some discussion questions. Yeah. So, here we go. 
And these are from you. These are right. good ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, in chapter 13, verses 2 and 3, it's, the question is this. In all three of the preceding Torah portions, there are lists of the leaders of the tribes with the same people mentioned each time. But why in this portion is an entirely new list of leaders mentioned? That's a great question. Are the spies, number two, are the spies ever referred to as spies? If so, where? If not, what is the Hebrew word used and what does it mean? Number three, in chapter 13, verses 17 to 20, identify the questions that the men were instructed to answer as they spied out the land. Organize them into two categories that would help define their mission. 1332, when Moshe sent the spies to Canaan, he told them to bring back a report about the land, the people, and the fruit. This is exactly what they did. So what crime did they commit? I just did what you told me. Mm -hmm. And all the people got upset, you know. It's, you know. There's, there's, a, there's a tradition, too, that, that states that they used the fruit to indict the land, as if, mm. as if to say... You know, they, they could talk about how big, how, how giant the people were, yeah. but they were using these objects that were also very large to help yeah. prove their point, yeah. and that that was egregious as well. I, yeah. I, Isn't that, that that's, something? There, there's something else there. But so what but, God gives as a blessing, they use as a weapon. Look, here's a giant. Him. Here's a giant fruit. <gasps> a giant fruit. Oh, that means there must be yeah. giants. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> uh. Um. And then the last one. What is the significance of the comparison to bread? And you know, if we can add one more, I would love if people could take some time to look at the commandment for zitzit, which is near mm -hmm. the end of this Torah portion, because it connects directly back to the sin of the spies. Mm -hmm. And there are some clues when you look at the commandment for zitzit. It's almost like this is the preventative measure, so what happened to the spies never happens again. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a beautiful connection, uh, if you find that. All right. Well, Why don't you pray for us? I would us love out. to. Our Father and our King, forgive us for all the times we fear things other than you. For to you belongs our fear, as Isaiah said. And to fear anything else other than you is sin. But Father, if we have a healthy fear of you, then we fear nothing else because you're our God. You're our creator, our redeemer, our protector, our healer, our savior. Uh, what do we have to fear? So Lord, may our only fear be that we would fear missing your will, fear not obeying you, fear of breaking your heart. So Father, make us the people you want us to be. Because we live in a world that is controlled by fear. May we be the exception. May we be lights in the darkness. May we be courageous when everyone else is quaking in their boots. And may we have faith when everyone else is experiencing fear. So may our knowledge of you and our love and our awe of you be a great light to people who need a rock to stand upon. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen.